Hello everyone and welcome back to Creation Myths. Today's topic is the creation myth that there was a recent and simultaneous origin for virtually all existing animal species. So to introduce this claim, this is based on a 2018 paper by Stokel and Thaler. Uh, I'll link that in the description. Uh, the claim that creationists make based on this paper is that virtually all animal species appeared at the same time, within the last 200,000 years, and that's not what the paper says, but it's it's a, in the neighborhood, and then creationists go on to argue, therefore, recent creation approximately 6,000 years ago. And I'll show you representative examples of these creationist arguments. So here we have our friend Dr. Nathaniel Jensen from AIG. Hundreds of thousands of species in a few thousand years. Recent mitochondrial DNA barcoding results bode well for the recent origin of species. And from Don Batten over at CMI, we have recent origin of species. A new DNA study challenges evolution's story. A major study of 5 million DNA barcodes on mitochondria has given some controversial results that fit well with the Bible's history in Genesis. So before we go any further, I just need to point out how bonkers it is the way that both uh, AIG and CMI misrepresent these sources. Both Jensen and Batten just go way out of left field to take the findings from this paper and twist them and contort them into something that they claim supports a young earth. So we'll start with Jensen here from AIG. He writes, we now have two decades worth of direct measurements of the rate at which human mitochondrial DNA mutates, and it matches exactly, exactly, the 6,000 year timescale and rejects the evolutionary timescale. That is completely bonkers, 100% incorrect. That is wrong. I've talked at length about how Jensen's mitochondrial most recent common ancestor calculations are wrong. To start with, he uses uh, mutation rates rather than substitution rates. You can't do a time to most recent common ancestor calculation using mutation rates. It's simply the wrong tool for the job. But it gets better from Jensen. This is, this is frankly amazing. So look at the second paragraph down here. He says, now let's re-extrapolate these results to other species. And then he quotes from the paper. He quotes the authors, except he leaves off the end of the passage. He writes, the simple hypothesis is that, or I should say he quotes, the simple hypothesis is that the same explanation offered for the sequence variation found among humans applies equally to the modern populations of essentially all other animal species. Namely, that the extant population, no matter what its current size or similarity to fossils of any age, has expanded from mitochondrial uniformity within the past, and that's the end of the quote, and what the authors say is within the past one to several thousand, uh, within the past one to several hundred thousand years. What Jensen writes is within the past, end of quote, 6,000 years. That is pretty impressive, even by the standards of AIG, and specifically Nathaniel Jensen. Now if you look over to Don Batten at CMI, he writes, they, the authors, write as evolutionists and make evolutionary assumptions to get this extended time frame, meaning hundreds of thousands of years. He goes on to say, with some slightly different assumptions about mutation rates, the data would fit neatly with the creation of all organisms about 6,000 years ago. In other words, if we do the math on mutation rates incorrectly, if we do this math the way that Jensen does the math, which is completely wrong, you can't use mutation rates that way. But if we do the math that wrong way, well, wouldn't you look at that? All these same species wind up in the same 6,000 year window as the human mitochondrial most recent common ancestor, which again is based on the incorrect math. So that's the caliber of the arguments coming out of AIG and CMI with regard to this paper. So here's the actual paper. This is a barcoding study, and barcoding is when you characterize species based on a very small part of their, it's usually for, for animals, it's part of their mitochondrial DNA. It's usually one of two genes, and in this case, they're looking at a single mitochondrial gene, the cytochrome oxidase subunit one gene. 
And what they do for this mitochondrial gene is they calculate the time to most recent common ancestor, TMRCA, for most animal species to within the last one to several hundred thousand years. That's, by the way, the phrase that Jeanson replaced with 6,000 years in that previous quote. So that's, for our purposes today, that's the takeaway here. Now, I have, there's a lot going on in this paper. The authors talk about a lot of stuff. It's very comprehensive. I don't agree with everything they say, but all of that is neither here nor there for the creationist claims with regard to this paper. So this is the relevant stuff for the creationist claims here, that we have a single mitochondrial gene, we're doing time to most recent common ancestor calculations across many species, and we find that the convergence point tends to be within the last few hundred thousand years. So why are the creationists wrong when they, let's say, interpret the paper this way? Well, first is that it doesn't show the origin of these species within the last 200,000 or so years. It shows a time to most recent common ancestor for that mitochondrial gene within that time frame, but the time to most recent common ancestor is not the origin. The origin is necessarily in the more distant past than the most recent common ancestor. We can illustrate this with this figure. For the origin to equal the time to most recent common ancestor, that would require zero loss of allelic diversity over time, meaning no selection, no drift, inbreeding, any of that stuff. But alleles are lost all the time. Every generation you lose alleles. So you can't just assume that the most recent common ancestor also represents the origin of the species in question. And we can illustrate this with this figure right here. So in this figure, we're looking at one, two, three, four, five generations of mitochondrial DNA, where the bottom is the most recent and the top is in the most distant past. And what we see here is if you look, you can you can look at the, the mitochondrial ancestry by color. So the black silhouette right here, that converges every individual in the current generation, goes back in time and converges right here to this individual in the past. That is the current mitochondrial most recent common ancestor. Now you'll note that she was not the only woman alive at the time. The reason for that, the reason why the mitochondrial most recent common ancestor was not the only individual alive at the time is that other mitochondrial genotypes are lost over generations. So you have all these other colors representing other mitochondrial lineages. And look what happens if you survey from a different generation. What if instead of this generation right here, we had done the calculations based on this generation? Well, you have pink, you have black, and you have orange. And if you go back in time to this generation, you still have pink, black, and orange, meaning the most recent common ancestor is going to be in the more distant past. Because again, the most recent common ancestor is the convergence point for the existing genetic diversity in the past. It's not the origin of the group in question. In order for those two things to be the same, you would need to have zero loss of diversity over generations. And that simply doesn't happen. You always lose alleles over generations through processes like selection and drift. So the first thing that creationists do that's wrong is they conflate this most recent common ancestor with the origin of the different species. The second problem is that the study itself actually shows the opposite of what creationists claim putting aside all their bonkers math, because they're saying you squeeze the mitochondria down into 6,000 years, therefore origin 6,000 years ago, right? That's their, what, what they're claiming. The, da the data in this study it sh itself show that that cannot be the case. You can't have the origins within that time frame. The reason for that is that the mitochondrial most recent common ancestor is going to be more recent than the most recent common ancestor for the rest of the genome. This is because mitochondrial DNA is maternally inherited. It's haploid. So it has a smaller effective population size, N sub E is the symbol for effective population size, than the nuclear DNA, right? The DNA in the rest of your, in the nucleus, rather than the mitochondria, which is most of the DNA in your cells is in the nucleus, not the mitochondria. Now, effective population size, for our purposes, it's a measure of genetic diversity, right? So if you have a larger effective population size, the convergence point is gonna be in the more distant past. Because the nuclear DNA is diploid, it has a larger effective population size than the haploid mitochondrial DNA. So it's going to converge in the more distant past. 
This is a necessary consequence of the relationship between the mitochondrial DNA and the nuclear DNA. We can illustrate how this works. So in this simple representation, we have many generations here, right? And the, the bottom is the present again, and the top for each diagram is the, is the past, right? Now, the width at the bottom indicates the effective population size. So we have mitochondrial DNA, and then we have greater effective population size for nuclear DNA. As you go from the bottom of the triangle to the top, it gets narrower. That represents the convergence, right? You're, you're taking your, your current level of diversity and you're working backwards until you have a common ancestor sequence. Now for mitochondrial DNA, creationists are saying, well, this study is about the mitochondria. We can make the mitochondria fit into a 6,000 year box. They incorrectly claim that this convergence point is 6,000 years in the past and also incorrectly claim that that convergence point represents the origin of the species in question. Both of those things are wrong, but let's ignore that for now. If that is the case, then you hop over to the nuclear DNA. You don't converge 6,000 years in the past. It's going to be way further in the past because of your larger effective population size. This means that we could assume that the young earth interpretation, I'll be polite and call it interpretation, the young earth misrepresentation is correct for the mitochondrial DNA stuff. We can just ignore all the problems ignore the misrepresentations, and we could just say, fine, that's all correct. The rest of the genome disproves the conclusion they are claiming you get from the mitochondria, because if the mitochondria converged 6,000 years ago, the rest of the genome is going to blow right by that limit, way, way out to beyond a young Earth time frame. And for that reason alone, everything creationists say about this study is wrong, even if you ignore all the other problems. So, to summarize, creationists claim this 2018 paper provides support for Young Earth conclusions. Uh, the paper doesn't do that at all. Creationists, like, pretty blatantly manipulate the author's conclusions and then say, plus, if you, if you do the math differently, if you do the math incorrectly, you get the Young Earth outcome. So they're just, like, making all sorts of errors to get the desired outcome in the first place. But along the way, they incorrectly conflate the mitochondrial most recent common ancestor with the origin of the species as a whole, which you cannot do. And they also ignore the implications for the nuclear genome, right? They're only focusing on the mitochondria. They're ignoring the much more diverse nuclear DNA that actually contradicts the desired conclusion, even if you ignore all of their other errors. So, do we have a recent and simultaneous origin for virtually all animal species? And in this specific case, based on, you know, the barcoding analysis of the mitochondrial gene? No, of course not. That is a creation myth, and it's a particularly sloppy one, I think, given the way they presented it. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. See you next time, and don't get fooled.